Welcome everyone to the Worship for Sleaford Methodist Circuit. My name's Paul Coburn. We'll begin our worship today with a prayer. Let us pray. Lord, you are a great and holy God. You are far, far greater than we could ever imagine. And you are far, far more holy than we could ever have understood. And you are also far, far more loving than we could have dared to hope. Mighty God, your authority is over the whole of creation and your purposes are for the good of all that you have made. In Jesus Christ, you have enabled us to comprehend something of who you are and what you are. In him, we have begun to grasp that you are not against us. In him, we are beginning to realise that you have always been seeking the lost, healing the broken and lifting the fallen. Now that we know Christ is your mirror image, we understand that there is not, there never was and there never will be any place or any person that can be called forsaken by you. We praise you, Lord God, for your love that reaches to the depths of our need and lifts us up to the heights you always meant us to be. You are our loving Lord. Your compassion, your kindness and your grace for everyone in every place causes us to break out in songs of joyful praise. May our praises so lift up the cross of Christ that all peoples everywhere may be drawn to him and confess him Lord of all. We ask our prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. And we'll sing our praise. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, this our song shall ever be. My starting point for these uh, worship videos has usually been the set lessons for the day and taking at least one of those to, to look at. But the basis of today's thoughts is somewhat different. It goes back 10 years or so to uh, the Christian um, Resources exhibition that I attended. And I went to hear one of the speakers who raised an interesting question, how do you read a book? And he pointed out that most books that you read, you don't pick a chapter somewhere in the middle and read half of that, and then perhaps go back to an earlier chapter and read the end part of that, 
and then perhaps turn to the, the beginning of the last chapter and look at that, but then put the rest of it aside and don't bother with it at all. When you read a book, you normally start at page one and you work your way through to the end of the book. And his point in drawing our attention to, to this was that the Bible is a book of books. And most of those books were meant to be read as books, starting at page one and reading our way through to the end, not just taking a little passage here and there, back and forth, and ignoring large chunks of it. I have to admit, uh, it is only true of most of the books. Uh, I would argue pro probably that um, Psalms and Proverbs are more like collections that you are intended to dip into. But I thought the speaker had a, a good point. We don't tend to read Bible books as a whole. So I came away from the Christian Resources exhibition determined to actually read the books of the Bible properly as they were meant to be read. Uh, I decided I would not just read a book once, but I would read uh, it two or three times in, in different translations and really try to get to grips with it, try to get the overview why it was written, what it meant to the people who first read it, and what God was saying to us now through that book. The question that I was then faced with was, in what order do I do this? Because I realised it was going to be a long-term project. I didn't feel like doing it in the obvious chronological order, starting at the beginning of the Bible. I wanted to mix things up a bit. I thought it would be good to look at um, a history book, for example, from the Old Testament, and then maybe one of Paul's letters, and then perhaps one of the Minor Prophets, and go back and forth and mix it up in terms of length of book and, and style of book and so on. But I didn't want to just do it picking a, a book um, at my own whim, uh, or almost at random, I felt I needed some kind of disciplined approach, otherwise I might end up just reading the books that I was already familiar with and ignoring the ones I didn't know much about. So I came up with what to me was a very simple solution. I decided to read the books of the Bible in alphabetical order. Obvious, really. You start with the book of Acts which is actually a very good starting place, I realised, when you come to reading the Bible. In some ways, even better than the Gospels, because the book of Acts gives us the account of how the, the message about Jesus first came across to people who perhaps hadn't seen him in the flesh. They, they didn't live in Israel. They, they hadn't seen him during his ministry. They didn't even know his name. And, and how they responded to the disciples' message, the good news that was being spread through the known world, is a, is a fascinating starting point to understand the, the Bible. Um, but we move on from Acts to Amos, 1 and 2 Chronicles, and so on. Well, with any uh, long-term project, there comes a time when you sort of run out of steam a bit, and, and that happened, and I had a few years when I... I, I didn't bother. But then I, I picked it up again and did it for a bit longer and ran out of steam again um, and had another several years gap. Uh, but I've recently picked it up again, the same idea. And I, I'm, I've started where I left off. We've got to the letter H. So I've been looking at the book of Habakkuk. Not a book I knew much about until recently. And I found it quite interesting. And I think there is a message in there for us today, which I would like to share with you. It's only three chapters long. I'm not going to read an excerpt from it now. I, I may find myself quoting from it as I go along. Uh, so you'll get little bits of it. But if you really want to know the whole of the book of Habakkuk, and if you don't have a Bible to hand, or you prefer to listen to someone else rather than read for yourself, at the end of this video, after the blessing, 
uh, if you want to hang around for another 10 15 minutes at the most uh, i will read for you the book of habakkuk but let's give you an overview at least what's it about who wrote it well it was written by habakkuk the prophet and we don't really know anything much about him uh, we've got his name in the book itself and he gets a, a mention in the Apocrypha. There's a few more stories about Daniel than you find in uh, the, the Bible proper. Uh, and in one of those, Daniel in a lion's den, uh, though I'm not if, sure if it was the same lion's den as we're familiar with, but he was in trouble. Uh, he was in a den of lions and, and Habakkuk was sent to him by God to provide a meal for him. Whether that's the same Habakkuk, I'm not sure, and how reliable that story is i don't know but we we know very little of who this person was we can um guess pretty much when he was alive because he talks about the up and coming babylonian empire and that dates it to around about 600 years bc or thereabouts but what was his message well it's actually an unusual approach that he takes if not actually unique amongst the prophets in the bible most of the prophets address the people, the people of Israel, uh, the readers who will read the prophecy later. And the message is often uh, you're doing something really bad and God's going to punish you for it unless you change your ways. Sometimes it's a message of comfort. You know, you've, you've had your punishment. You, you think it's uh, all over and God doesn't love you anymore. Well, he does. And, and you'll be all right. Messages of comfort. Habakkuk doesn't do that. He doesn't address the people. He addresses God directly. And what we have really is, is just uh, listening in to a conversation between the prophets and God. We get the prophets' complaints and then we get what God answered him. And that's the content of the book. Uh, there is a psalm section attached to the, the end as the third chapter. I'll come to that in a moment. But the, the first bit of it is a conversation uh, between Habakkuk and God. And it starts off with a complaint. Habakkuk says, what are you playing at, God? L letting all this wickedness and injustice happen. I see it all around me and you're doing nothing about it. What's going on? I am, you realise, paraphrasing. But, I mean, not, not far off. Uh, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? He's not a happy bunny. Why is God doing nothing about all the, the wickedness that he sees? And God answers him. God says, I'm going to do something that will uh, surprise you and amaze you. What I'm going to do is raise up this vicious and cruel nation, the Babylonians, and, and they'll come bloodthirsty and, and conquering and powerful. Nobody will be able to resist them. And they'll come sweeping in and, and destroy the nations. I think the, the implication being uh, that they'll destroy the wicked people that's God's answer Habakkuk is not happy with that answer and neither am I if I'm honest though possibly for a slightly different reason to Habakkuk but Habakkuk is not is not happy and so he complains again and his second complaint is how could you use a, a corrupt and evil empire for your purposes God you're a holy God. How can you uh, think even of using this, this terrible, wicked, cruel, awful nation called the Babylonians? What are you thinking about? That's not the way to deal with the situation. And then Habakkuk waits and listens to see what God has to say to that. And God's answer is, don't worry. I'm on it. It'll all work out. The time will come when it'll be sorted. But don't think this wicked nation is going to get away with it. They'll get their comeuppance. 
they'll get all, all the evil that they've perpetrated back on themselves. So don't worry. And God pronounces a whole series of, of woes to this nation, to the Babylonians. Woe to you. You've, you've done this and you've done that and it'll all come back to haunt you. You'll, you'll get the punishment. And at the end of that, Habakkuk seems to be satisfied that the last bit of the, the, uh, the response is, uh, if I find the right page, uh, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. It reminds me a little bit of, of Job, who after all his many complaints and uh, a lot longer uh, than the book of Habakkuk, uh, in the end, Job said, I shouldn't have spoken. I should have just kept my mouth shut. And there's a little sense of this here. Habakkuk satisfied, conversation over, silence is, is the only response although he doesn't stay silent because the third and the final chapter then is a psalm of praise and maybe this was added later uh, there's an amusing bit right at the end actually in some translations uh, it's got a, a little bit at the end which normally comes at the beginning of a psalm and it could be that somebody copied this in and, and they copied a bit too much and they copied uh, the instructions for the next psalm maybe but maybe this is a book, uh, it is a psalm by Habakkuk, uh, even if it was copied in later. Uh, maybe someone said, oh, we've got Habakkuk's prophecy. He, he, didn't he write that psalm? Let's put that in as well. I, I don't know. But it ends with a psalm of praise. And, and the psalm is, is all about how wonderful God is, how God should be trusted. But it, it does describe God in a, a very fearful and frightening way. A, a warrior God striding through the land, bringing pestilence and, and plague and death. Um, a, a God who, who is going to destroy the wicked. Uh, it, it's a, a very militaristic kind of view of, of God. And the author uh, of the psalm is trembling at this. You know, wow, what a, a mighty God, a wonderful God, a God who's done great things for me. But wow, he's a bit scary. The end of the psalm does end on a, a slightly more positive note. Let's actually, uh, let's actually finish on a more positive note. Uh, even when the land's devastated, even when things are going terribly wrong, still, I will trust you, Lord, says the, the writer. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. A little image at the end there, which I think is quite a lovely little image, um, if you're going up on the heights, the mountain areas, it's, it's craggy, it, it's difficult terrain. And if you were walking on that difficult terrain, you could very easily stumble, you know, get your feet down a crack, stumble over loose rocks and so on. But deer don't seem to have that trouble. Mountain goats, uh, antelopes, they're, they're sure-footed. They bound from crag to crag without losing their step. And that image at the end is, is saying that God will make my feet like the feet of a deer, so I'll be able to cope with the difficult terrain. Uh, it's still difficult. Life is going to be hard, but I won't stumble and fall. God will help me to leap from crag to crag and, and get over the, the difficulties. A nice little image to end with. But what do we make of all that? Is it a message for us today? I think the, the, there are some key messages here. One is that it's all right to complain to God. Don't be afraid to, to take your frustrations to God and, and tell him. If you don't think that God's doing his job properly, say so. He can take it, but be prepared to listen to an answer. Don't just throw off your complaints and, and that's it. Be prepared to actually listen and see what God wants to say back to you. Make it a conversation 
okay? But say what you feel and, and Habakkuk feels strongly and, and say so, but he listens and he hears God's response. And as I say, I think Habakkuk ends up satisfied. The, the, the first response, he thinks, no, that's not right. He complains that there's too much wickedness around him. And God says, okay, I'm going to send a really cruel nation to, to kill off all the wicked people. And there's an important verse here that um, St. Paul actually picks up and makes a, a strong theme of this. Uh, he says, uh, uh, the righteous will live by faith. What he's meaning by that in Habakkuk uh, is, that, is that this Babylonian uh, conquering of the nation will affect the wicked people. But if you have faith, if you remain righteous, you will live. You won't be killed off. So don't worry, it'll only affect the bad guys. And Habakkuk seems okay with the idea that uh, the bad guys will be killed off. He's not happy about the means by which it happens. Even badder guys, uh, even more wicked people will come and, and do the dirty deed. Uh, that's what Habakkuk is worried about. How can you use evil people to, to destroy the wicked people that I'm complaining about. It seems almost as if he'd have been all right if it was a, a, a nice conquering nation that came down, but it, it's the fact that they're wicked that upsets him. My problem with this is surely that's not the way to deal with wickedness. Surely, Lord, you, you don't um, deal with wickedness and injustice and the terrible things going on in life by sending an empire to destroy the wicked people. Wickedness needs to be dealt with differently somehow. And I believe that in Jesus and in his, his teaching, we, we have a, a better message, one of forgiveness, loving your enemies. Salvation is the way, um, not destruction, we want to save people from their own wickedness. We want to uh, save communities from being full of injustice and unfairness to make them proper communities where people love one another and care for one another. Th there is a far better way. And one of the things I take encouragement from in uh, the book of Habakkuk is in the first bit of God's second answer. Okay, uh, he says, uh, write down the revelation. This is actually how he starts. Write down the revelation, says God. Make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. That, that phrase apparently is a bit obscure. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false, though it linger wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. The, the vision that God is speaking about will come about. It'll seem to happen not very quickly, but trust me, says God, it's going to happen. It'll all come out right. And I think for Habakkuk, that was enough to say, okay, God's got it in hand. And he thought God's way of dealing with it, with it would be, well, the wicked nation, the wicked Babylonians will get their comeuppance in the end and that will be all right. I think God's way of dealing with it is much more through Christ, through his sacrifice on the cross, through his opening the way to forgiveness, a restored relationship with God. Habakkuk lived in a very different time. His values, I think, were perhaps different. It was a, a more warlike time and uh, Nations did conquer other nations very much more even than this happening today. Today, we are, I think, better than we used to be. The very fact that I get um, worried about God's response and say, that's, that's not right, God, that's not the way you should be doing it. Whereas Habakkuk seemed to me, okay, that's fine, you know, kill off the wicked nation once they've done their deed, once they've, once they've been used as your instruments, then, you know, they get their comeuppance, that's fine. No, 
that's not right. It's not fine. And, and the fact that I, and I suspect many other people who, who read books like Habakkuk, uh, would think the same thing, means that we, we are moving. We are becoming more caring and compassionate, more tolerant. Not entirely. We still live in a world with um, ambitious empires spreading. We still live in a world with war and, and hatred and, and horrible acts of violence. I don't dispute that. But we also live in a world where, where many, many people know that's wrong and want to build community and want to, to uh, ensure there is justice and want there to be love. And it's not just a case of, you know, love us and hate them. It's a case of seeing the whole world as needing to love one another and live in harmony. We are moving towards that. And to me, the good thing about the promise of Habakkuk, uh, or the promise God makes to Habakkuk, is it'll come one day. It might seem to linger. It is seeming to linger. We're still not there. But trust my promise, says God. I do have it in hand. And, and I think the reason that he's delaying is because it takes time. I think the people of Habakkuk's day uh, weren't ready for a, a world of, of compassion and tolerance and understanding of the nations. And maybe we're still not quite ready. We're still working towards that. But God's working with us and, and we'll get there. And we need to trust God that it, it will work out. Yes, we, we might wonder why he's taking so long. Can't you move things along a bit quicker? But as he says, it's got its appointed time and it will come. Just hang in there. It's not going to fizzle out this plan of mine, says God. It'll come to fruition. So I find that, in the end, an encouraging message. I'm looking at life very differently to the way Habakkuk looked at it. My argument with God might be very different, but I think there are some uh, lovely passages here that actually bring hope for the future. What we're going to do now is pray for the world that we live in, and pray for it to be a, a better place. I'm not going to complain to God. I think we'll make our prayers a little more um, trusting that he, he's got it in hand. Let us pray. Lord God, we, we bring before you the needs of today's world, a world where there is still, as in Habakkuk's time, great wickedness, great injustice. The, there are people who suffer who have done nothing to deserve that suffering. There are poor nations who go hungry because rich nations have treated them unfairly. <clears throat> there are people who suffer because of uh, cruel leadership, dictators, warmongers. Lord, help us to work towards a better world and play your part, we pray, Lord. Don't, don't just stand back and leave it all to us. Lord, come and help. Give us the strength we need. Give us the wisdom we need as a human race to set things right and lead us towards the, the better future that you have prepared for us in Jesus. In him, you've shown us how to love. You've shown us how to live. Help us as a human race to work towards that. And in the meantime, Lord, give your strength and hope to those who suffer. Be with the, the victims of cruelty and violence and help them to keep going and to keep faith and to trust and hope. Be with those who suffer through illness and disease, who are in pain and struggle with daily life and give them hope and comfort and help us to know how we can support and strengthen them. Lord, bless our world, we pray, for the sake of of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's join in the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
And we're going to sing again. And the, the hymn I've chosen is an obvious choice because partly it's dealing with some of the themes I've talked about. God is working his purpose out. It, it's happening. God is at work. But partly because it uses an image from the book of Habakkuk. Uh, part of God's answer about what's going to happen in the future is for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That image is picked up in the last line of each verse. So let's sing together. And may now the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, rest upon you and be with all those you love, now and evermore. Amen. The worship is over. You may go in peace. Or, as I said earlier, if you're prepared to hang around for another 10, 12 minutes, something like that, I will read to you from the Good News Bible, which is, um, I think, a, a slightly kinder translation than uh, some of the more uh, absolutely literal translations. And I will read to you the book of Habakkuk. Uh, and hopefully you'll recognise both my overview uh, and some of the thoughts that I, I shared about it. This is the message that the Lord revealed to the prophet Habakkuk. O oh Lord, how long must I call for help? 
before you listen, before you save us from violence. Why do you make me see such trouble? How can you endure to look on such wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are all around me and there is fighting and quarrelling everywhere. The law is weak and useless and justice is never done. Evil men get the better of the righteous and so justice is perverted. Then the Lord said to his people, keep watching the nations around you and you will be astonished at what you see. I am going to do something that you will not believe when you hear about it. I am bringing the Babylonians to power, those fierce, restless people. They are marching across the world to conquer other lands. They spread fear and terror, and in their pride they are a law unto themselves. Their horses are faster than leopards, fiercer than hungry wolves. Their horsemen come riding from distant lands. Their horses paw the ground. They come swooping down like eagles attacking their prey. Their armies advance in violent conquest and everyone is terrified as they approach. Their captives are as numerous as grains of sand. They treat kings with contempt and laugh at high officials. No fortress can stop them. They pile up earth against it and capture it. Then they sweep on like the wind and are gone. These men whose power is their God. Lord, from the very beginning, you are God. You are my God, holy and eternal. Lord, my God and protector, you have chosen the Babylonians and made them strong so they can punish us. But how can you stand those treacherous, evil men? Your eyes are too holy to look at evil, and you cannot stand the sight of people doing wrong. So why are you silent while they destroy people who are more righteous than they are? How can you treat people like fish, or like a swarm of insects that have no ruler to direct them. The Babylonians catch people with hooks as though they were fish. They, they drag them off in nets and shout for joy over their catch. They even worship their nets and offer sacrifices to them because their nets provide them with the best of everything. Are they going to keep using their swords forever and keep on destroying nations without mercy. I will climb my watchtower and wait to see what the Lord will tell me to say and what answer he will give to my complaint. The Lord gave me this answer. Write down clearly on clay tablets what I reveal to you so that it can be read at a glance. Put it in writing because it is not yet time for it to come true. But the time is coming quickly, and what I show you will come true. It may seem slow in coming, but wait for it. It will certainly take place, and it will not be delayed. And this is the message. Those who are evil will not survive, but those who are righteous will live because they are faithful to God. Wealth is deceitful. Greedy men are proud and restless. Like death itself, they are never satisfied. That is why they conquer nation after nation for themselves. The conquered people will taunt their conquerors and show their scorn for them. They will say, you take what is yours, but you are doomed. How long will you go on getting rich by forcing your debtors to pay up? But before you know it, you that have conquered others will be in debt yourselves and will be forced to pay interest. Enemies will come and make you tremble. They will plunder you. You have plundered 
the people of many nations. But now those who have survived will plunder you because of the murders you have committed and because of your violence against the people of the world and its cities. You are doomed. You've made your family rich with what you took by violence and have tried to make your own home safe from harm and danger. But your schemes have brought shame on your family. By destroying many nations, you've only brought ruin on yourself. Even the stones of the walls cry out against you and the rafters echo the cry. You are doomed. You founded a city on crime and built it up by murder. The nations you conquered wore themselves out in useless labour and all they have built goes up in flames. The Lord Almighty has done this. But the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the seas are full of water. You were doomed. In your fury, you humiliated and disgraced your neighbours. You made them stagger as though they were drunk. You, in turn, will be covered with shame instead of honour. You yourself will drink and stagger. The Lord will make you drink your own cup of punishment and your honour will be turned to disgrace. You have cut down the forests of Lebanon. Now you will be cut down. You killed its animals. Now animals will terrify you. This will happen because of the murders you have committed and because of your violence against the people of the world and its cities. What's the use of an idol? It's only something that a man has made and it tells you nothing but lies. What good does it do for its maker to trust it? A God that can't even talk. You are doomed. You say to a, a piece of wood, wake up. Or to a block of stone, get up. Can an idol reveal anything to you? It may be covered with silver and gold, but there is no life in it. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let everyone on earth be silent in his presence. This is a prayer of the prophet Habakkuk. O Lord, I have heard of what you have done and I'm filled with awe. Now do it again in our times, the great deeds you used to do. Be merciful even when you are angry. God is coming again from Edom. The holy God is coming from the hills of Paran. His splendour covers the heavens and the earth is full of his praise. He comes with the brightness of lightning. Light flashes from his hand. There is where his power lies, there where his power is hidden. He sends disease before him and commands death to follow him. When he stops, the earth shakes. At his glance, the nations tremble. The eternal mountains are shattered. The everlasting hills sink down, the hills where he walked in ancient times. I saw the people of Kushan afraid and the people of Midian tremble. Was it the rivers that made you angry, Lord? Was it the sea that made you furious? You rode upon the clouds. The storm cloud was your chariot as you brought victory to your people. You got ready to use your bow, ready to shoot your arrows. Your lightning split open the earth. When the mountains saw you, they trembled. Water poured down from the skies. The waters under the earth roared and their waves rose high. At the flash of your speeding arrows and the gleam of your shining spear, the sun and the moon stood still. You marched across the earth in anger, in fury. You trampled the nations. You went out to save your people, to save your chosen king. You struck down the leader of the wicked and completely destroyed his followers. Your arrows pierced the commander of his army when it came like a storm to scatter us, gloating like those who secretly oppressed the poor. You trampled the sea with your horses and the mighty waters foamed. I hear all this and I tremble. My lips quiver with fear. My body goes limp and my feet 
stumble beneath me. I will quietly wait for the time to come when God will punish those who attack us. Even though the fig trees have no fruit and no grapes grow on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no corn, even though the sheep all die and the cattle stalls are empty, I will still be joyful and glad because the Lord my God is my saviour. The Lord gives me strength. He makes me sure-footed as a deer and keeps me safe on the mountains.